of what was one of John McLaughlin, our club's founder, uh, his project with Paul Zygo and Marie Summers. And uh, I'll leave that discussion up to Paul. So in a minute, we'll start up with that. Um, just a few housekeeping items first. If you haven't paid your dues, please do so. Uh, we can collect them. You can mail them in. They help pay for the lecturers. And at the end of Paul's lecture, Nancy Webster has a short presentation as well. So stay tuned, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Paul is a history professor and author, a military and historian, and he's founder of the World War II Era Studies Institute. The institute is dedicated to furthering one's knowledge and understanding of the World War II era and its impact on history. He's a graduate of Temple College, or Temple University, and the University, um, I'm sorry, the United States Army War College. He authored and edited in 2009, Witnessing History, the Eisenhower Photographs, featuring all the photos of General Dwight D. Eisenhower taken by his personal wartime photographer, Al Messerling. Um, Paul Zygo was also the executive producer and narrator of the cable TV network series, Triumphant Spirit, America's World War II Generation Speaks from 2001 to 2004. In 2014, he authored the book, The Longest Walk, The Amazing Story of the 29th Infantry Division on D-Day, June 6, 1944. And uh, he spoke to our club about that. And he co-authored the book, Bataan, When Men Have to Die, an accounting of the fall of the Philippine Islands uh, to the Japanese in 1942. Mr. Zygo is a 30-year veteran of the United States Army, retiring as a colonel. Mm -hmm. And so without further ado, I hand the microphone. Rich, thank you, truly. And ladies and gentlemen, you can call me anything you want, except for what my wife calls me. <laughs> I would appreciate it. <laughs> one of the reasons why I'm standing here, one of the principal reasons, is because of the encouragement, the inspiration, the leadership shown me and Marie Summers in putting together this book that we're going to be commenting on tonight. And that is When Men Have to Die. And that individual was Dr. John McLaughlin. There are very, very few people within the world in which I roam, in which I truly, truly admired and respected as I did John. So if you would Ladies and gentlemen, what do you say we just stand in honor of John McLaughlin for just a moment? Thank you, everybody. And Mary Jean, I'm very, very glad to see you here tonight. Very glad to see you here tonight. All right. I've been invited here to speak about the topic that you see on that screen. When men have to die. Occurs during the course of the fall of the Philippines in May of 1942. When this occurs, it's a major significant event within American military history. It's the largest, largest surrender of a military force within U.S. military history. But I'd like to explain to you is why. Why did this happen? You know what happened now, but why did it happen? So we'd like to examine that. To a certain extent, it is examined within the book that John McLaughlin and Marie Summers and I co-authored. I'll probably be more specific tonight, hopefully, enable you to further understand what really occurred when the Philippines were surrendered in May of 1942. Now, by the way, let's take a look at this being the case that 75 years ago this year, 75 years ago this year. So, let's move on. The Philippines, Fairboat's understanding, the pre-war World War II Philippines, they are American colonial possession. An American colonial possession consisting of 7,100 islands with a population of some 17 million people. The country's capital, 
located in approximately the center of that screen known as Manila. And it's on the largest island within the Philippine Islands, Luzon. Now let's take a look at what the situation was in the fall of 1941 that was facing the Filipino government, the U.S. military, and what brought about, what brought about in the end major catastrophe for the United States. In the fall of 1941, take a look where the Philippines are located within the Pacific Ocean. The islands set aside a key sea lane flown from Southeast Asia to the Japanese home islands along the coast of China. Once again pointing out where the Philippines happen to be. Take a look at that stretch of of ocean between the Philippine Islands and the South China Sea. Key, key sea lane for the Japanese Empire. And preparing to defend the Philippines against a feared Japanese seizure is the Philippine Army, consisting of 10, however, relatively untrained reserve divisions, 110 men, supplemented with an American military contingent consisting of 30,000 troops. Keep in mind, we had our troops there because this is an American <coughs> colonial possession. American territory. And to deter Japanese aggression, if indeed it did occur, the U.S. Army Air Corps does base at Clark Field on Luzon Island. 35 B-17 bombers, 170, 107 P-40 fighters, and 100 support planes the largest concentration of U.S. air power in the Pacific. Now one thing that's not concentrated here is any naval power. Now think back for a moment, where do you think that naval power was concentrated within the Pacific? Hawaii. Hawaii. Pearl Harbor. <coughs> However, as far as the largest concentration of U.S. air power, it's in the Philippines. U.S. naval power that was based within the Philippines, primarily in Manila Harbor, totaled three cruisers, 13 destroyers, 40 motor torpedo boats, 29 submarines. All right. And despite the commitment to the training and equipment of the Philippine military, the one thing, the one thing about this effort is continually underfunded by isolationist American Congress. And why? Because the American public did not want to be involved in any conflict, not just in the Far East, but also in Europe. You, the American public, basically telling our government, stay the hell away. Stay the hell away. So as a consequence, this is one of the, one of the outcomes of this isolationist period. As far as the military command located within the Philippines, let me point this out. Here's the structure. Command of the U.S. Far East Forces was Lieutenant General Douglas MacArthur. <coughs> command of the Northern Luzon Force, which was a subordinate force to MacArthur, known as North, the Northern Luzon Force, its commander is Major General. Jonathan Wainwright. Another subordinate force is the Southern Luzon Force, and Major General George Park was in charge of that. Commander of U.S. Far East Army Air Forces, Brigadier General Lewis Byrd. Commander of U.S. Asiatic Fleet, Admiral Thomas Hart. Then you have one more commander. And here's the individual that was in charge of all of the Philippine Army south of the Luzon Island. And they were located on all the other islands located within the overall Philippine, Philippine group. Now, to be specific, take a look at the largest island within that group. That's Luzon. And here's where the Northern Luzon Force was located to the north of Manila. South of Manila, 
you had the Southern Luzon Force under Parker. And then what you had located at three airfields was the Air Force, Army Air Force, <coughs> under the Bird. The most noted airfield is Clark Field, just north of Manila. In charge of the U.S. Asiatic Fleet is Admiral Hart, and take a look where he's based, within Manila Harbor. Now, as far as General Douglas MacArthur is concerned, he retired in 1937 as Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. He didn't want to go. He wanted to remain in position. However, President of the United States, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, said, you're out. You're out. Appropriately, because he had reached his retirement age. But MacArthur did not want to leave. One of the primary reasons why he did not is because he wanted to remain within the public eye. He had in the back of his mind sometime in the future of running for the President of the United States. Please keep this in mind. However, at this particular time, FDR basically says, MacArthur, you're retired. And he does. But then take a look at what comes about. He accepts an offer from the Philippine government to become its military advisor. And he's awarded the rank of field marshal, tasked with forming a Philippine army to defend the islands against any attack. And here's a good picture of MacArthur at the time, talking to the Philippine president, President Quezon. And he's as far as MacArthur is concerned, take the uniform that he's wearing. It's a uniform of the Philippine military bearing the rank of Marshal. As far as his effort, it's a half-hearted one. Even though MacArthur does know that a threat exists, but he ignores the capabilities of most that would create this immediate threat meaning the Japanese military, believing that the Japanese military will never assault the Philippines. Never assault the Philippines. So what does he spend those funds that are allocated to the Philippine defense by the U.S. military, U.S. government? Spends most of the funds on parades and public ceremonies instead of the training of the men and the units for active defense of the Philippines. In July of 1941, take a look what happens. He's recalled to active duty by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the face of the rising fear of conflict with Japan. And when he is once activated, look at what he refuses to do. He refuses to adhere to a war plan known as War Plan Orange, which was mandated by the U.S. War Department. Now, I'd like to further explain this because this is significant. War Plan Orange, it's part of the overall Allied goal chosen basically by the British and the Americans in 1941 to combat any possible aggression. At this time, keep in mind, Great Britain was at war with Nazi Germany, but we were not. We were not. But via a meeting between our military chiefs and the British military chiefs, we come up with Rainbow Five War Plan. Point number one, because war was active in Europe, take a look at where the focus of this whole plan happens to be first. Germany. So it's what's known as the Germany First Strategy. As far as the Philippine Islands are concerned, they're to be defended with existing forces supported by the largest air force that we have within the Far East. As far as the Philippines, they are not to be reinforced. The idea was the force on the island, if indeed the island was invaded, to withdraw on onto the Tan Peninsula, and hold there, preventing the use of Manila Harbor by the Japanese, and then await the return of the U.S. military while doing so. So this is the overall 
rainbow by war plan. War plan orange is part of it. And the focus of war plan orange was the defense of the Bataan Peninsula to prevent the Japanese from utilizing Manila Harbor, if indeed they did capture the islands. This is the plan that MacArthur ignores. As far as his judgments, let's go down them. One, he going to ignore war plan orange because he determines that he can defend the island of Luzon by continuing to position his major forces north of Manila and south of Manila, as opposed to concentrating them on the Tab Peninsula. Any positions, therefore, food supply sites, medical supplies, ammunition depots, all throughout the islands, all throughout the islands, instead of concentrating them on Bataan. And he believes that the possession of the largest concentration of U.S. air power in the Pacific will ward off any Japanese military assault. And if war breaks out, he counts on reinforcements immediately to come to his aid from the U.S. to assist in defending the islands. These are his judgments. In perspective, he's determined to run his own war. He's determined to run his own war regardless of the direction and the guidance given to him by military chiefs in Washington, D.C. As far as MacArthur, who's he pictured with? He's positioned with his individual that commands the North Luzon Force as General Wainwright. Now, during the course of all this unfolding, take a look at what comes about. A war warning on November 27, 1941. Can I have somebody read that war warning? Can I have somebody read that? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. okay. I'll have you read it. This dispatch is to be considered a war warning. Negotiations with Japan looking toward stabilization of conditions in the Pacific have ceased and an aggressive move by Japan is expected in the next few days. The number and equipment of Japanese troops and the organization of naval task forces indicates an amphibious expedition against either the Philippines, Thai, or KRA Peninsula, or possible Borneo. Execute an appropriate defense deployment prep preparatory to carrying out the tasks assigned in WPL 46. Our WPL stands for War Plan. War Plan. 46, all part of War Plan Orange. All part of War Plan Orange. Where did this war warning come from? It came from Admiral Harold Stark, Chief of Staff, U.S. Navy. General George Marshall, Chief of Staff, U.S. Army. And via the course of this war warning, look what they specifically identify as a major threat to the United States. And that is an amphibious expedition against the Philippines, an American colonial possession. All right, with this having now been issued, let's take a look at the status of U.S. forces on December 8, 1941. December 8, 1941, do want to point out to you that December 8th in the Philippines is December 7th at Pearl Harbor. Because it's on the other side of the international date line. All right. Ground forces are placed on full alert status throughout the islands due to this war warning. And keep in mind where these forces were located. All throughout the islands. Not as War Plan Orange had dictated. And that is to concentrate them on the peninsula known as Bataan. As far as the Army Air Force units, they're grounded wingtip to wingtip 
on all bases with the air crews, with the air crews at the ready for immediate takeoff. Take a look at how these planes were lined up, ready for use, ready for use. There was a request by General Brer after he had heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor to immediately launch those planes at his disposal to do scouting in and around the Philippines to see if indeed the Japanese might be concentrating a naval force nearby to attack the Philippines, in particular Manila Harbor. However, MacArthur, not believing that the Japanese are going to attack the Philippines, does not answer. Does not answer the request. Those planes are never launched. Naval forces, they're at dockside with crews at battle stations. And take a look at what this all looked like. With this being the case, What's the result on December 8th, 1941? Complete surprise! Complete surprise that the Japanese attacked the Philippines. And as a result, let's take a look at what occurs. Japanese do conduct an air attack on December 8th. It's conducted at noon. Conducted that noon, and the Japanese used fighters and bombers coming from Formosa, not from any carrier force, but from Formosa, to attack the air bases. Just when U.S. air crews are absent from the airfields, and for the most part, standing down for a lunch. The attack was originally scheduled for earlier in the morning to coincide with the attack of Pearl Harbor. But a heavy fog delays, delays the takeoff of those planes for a good six hours. This, by the way, benefited the Japanese attack force. This benefited the Japanese attack force. The air attack, it destroys 90% of the U.S. Far East Army Air Force on the ground, enabling the Japanese to gain almost complete air superiority. Take a look at that picture. That's how devastating that attack was. Keep in mind how the planes were situated on the airfields within the Philippines. Wingtip to wingtip to wingtip. And after the air attack, an expected Japanese amphibious assault on the islands doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And this results in all these alerted forces by the order of MacArthur to stand down, stand down. And they do so and gain a sigh of relief because the Japanese, although they struck by air, they had not stricken any other way, be it in most cases a feared amphibious assault. So they gain a sigh of relief until December 10th, until December 10th. What happens on December 10th? The invasion is launched by the Japanese military. Now let's take a look at this. They utilize two reinforced divisions of experienced Japanese 14th Army to assault and seize all of Luzon. Key target on Luzon is Manila, the capital. The forces, they're expected to capture Luzon within 50 days, so that the units that are being employed in this operation can be used elsewhere. Because at this particular time, the Japanese are also advancing through Malaysia. They're also advancing through many of the islands in the Southwest Pacific. So as far as the Japanese military is concerned, they gave the overall commander 50 days to accomplish the mission of taking out the U.S. military and capturing, capturing the Philippines. Let's take a look at now this map. I'm going to point out where the Japanese landed. I'll be more specific in a moment. 14th Army to conduct amphibious assaults at Apari in Vigan. That's located in the north 
all goes on. You'll see the date, December 10th, noted. And you'll see the two towns also noted. Their goal, seize the local airfields and pin down the northern Luzon force up there. Now the 14th Army also was tasked to conduct another amphibious operation at Legaspi in southern Luzon. Southern Luzon. And that's conducted on December 12th to seize all the local airfields. Where is Legaspi on the map? We'll take a look to the far right. You'll see it's at the base of Luzon Island. Do they stop? No. No. They conduct another major amphibious invasion of Luzon at Lagayan Gulf on the 22nd of December to further pin down the northern Luzon force which is fighting to the north and then advance and then capture Luz Manila. Do they stop? No. Conduct another major amphibious invasion of Luzon at Lamont Bay on December 24th. Advance north and aid in the capture of Manila. All right. A lot of detail. A lot of detail. But the key point to all this is, I can point out where the specific invasion sites are located. There's a party. There's Vigong. There's Legaspi. There's the guy in Gulf. There's Lamont Bay. Operations that MacArthur did not believe, did not believe the Japanese military could ever carry out in assault on the Philippine Islands. And one thing about MacArthur through the course of his military career, this is coming from my, my study of U.S. military history, one of the major faults of General Duncan MacArthur was that he always underestimated the enemy. Over underestimated the enemy. Here's a prime example. There's another time within his military career when he underestimated the enemy. Right, right, when the Chinese military entered into the Korean War, surprisingly attacking the United Nations forces in Korea. MacArthur never thought the Chinese would ever attack the UN. They did. Once again, indication of one of his key traits as a, as a general. Always underestimated the enemy. Now, as far as the architect of this plan, his name Lieutenant General Masahura Homa. He's the commander of the Japanese 14th Army. Now, we can't run this film, but it's a Japanese film that would indicate what took place during the course of these various <coughs> invasions. And in essence, it would show you how capable this military was in confronting the Philippine Army and the American Army. Now the impact of the invasion, MacArthur, he's faced now with Japanese forces advancing on Manila from the north and from the south. And he's facing these, these forces with him lacking any air support. Keep in mind what happened to his air force. 90% of it was wiped out on December 8th, 1941. Look what he chooses to do. He now executes War Plan Orange. The plan he ignored. The plan he ignored. So what does he do? He withdraws the Southern Luzon Force onto the Bataan Peninsula. While the Northern Luzon Force fights a desperate delaying action to permit this withdrawal. So here's a good picture of Bataan Peninsula. It's right beside Manila Harbor. And the one thing about this piece of terrain, you control this piece of terrain, you deny anyone, anyone, the use of Manila Harbor. You deny anyone the use of Manila Harbor. 
after the Southern Luzon Force is withdrawn, then the Northern Luzon Force is withdrawn onto Peninsula. And now, all those forces on Luzon are concentrated on the Peninsula of Bataan. As in essence, as in essence, was the demand of War Plan Orange. When he withdraws those forces on the Bataan, look what MacArthur does. He declares Manila an open city, and that's to influence the Japanese not to bomb the capital, and then he therefore relocates his headquarters to an island in the middle of the Manila Harbor. And that island is known as Corregidor. Where's Corregidor on this map? Down there on the lower right. It's approximately three miles south of the Bataan Peninsula. And then he initiates the nine Japanese the use of Manila Harbor, aiming goal of all his military operations by fighting a delaying action on Bataan, the original goal of War Plan Orange. The original goal. Now what's missing from Bataan at this particular time? Well, let me see if I can have you think through this. What did he not place on Bataan during the course of the time when he was executing his own war plan? What? All right, we have no air. We have no defenses because there are none prepared. All right, very good. Because what's so critical are food supplies. What are so critical? Ammunition supplies. What is so critical are medical supplies. All critical needs to adequately supply a force of, now take a look at how many are located on this Bataan Peninsula. 68,000 Filipino troops, some 12,000 American troops. Now concentrated on Bataan as of January 1st, 1942. So what comes about now? Well, that's the question. What now? What now? Well, let's take a look. What MacArthur does immediately is plea for the following. Just with pleas for ammunition, medical supplies, and food, all of which he ignored stockpiling on the town for war plan arch. And he pleads for relief forces from the U.S. To come to his aid. What's the War Department's response? Well, who's in charge of the War Department this time? Individual name of Henry Stimson. What's his response? Well, to bolster Sagamorel and Batan, the department does send, initially, a message that aid is in the process of being organized. However, are reinforcements ever sent to Batan? No. Because where are those reinforcements supposed to be going? They're supposed to be going, yes, to fight the Germans because of the Germany first uh, plan. But it's President FDR's order in response to MacArthur's pleas and the War Department's response. He orders MacArthur off the islands on March 11, to assume command of U.S. forces being sent to Australia to eventually counterattack the Japanese. Does he reach the Australia base that he's designated to take over and thereafter command the American military in Australia? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And when he gets there, MacArthur being MacArthur, he makes a very famous statement. Right, and what's the key word in that phrase? I, right, I, not us, not the U.S. I shall return. This is the nature of General Douglas MacArthur. All right, but let's not take it away from him. Does he return? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. All right, let's move on. At a conference on the issue of defense of Bataan in early January, take a look at 
what Secretary of War Henry Stimson states to President FDR. There are times when men have to die. There are times when men have to die. In essence, at this conference, the defending forces on Batan are doomed. And they knew it. And they knew it. What comes about because of this change of command, MacArthur being ordered to Australia? Well, let's take a look at this. The commander of the U.S. forces in the Far East on Luzon now is General Jonathan Wainwright. Look where his headquarters happen to be, on Corregidor Island. That's the headquarters that MacArthur left to go to Australia. Command of all forces on the Bataan Peninsula, subject to the orders of Jonathan Wainwright, is Major General Edward King. His headquarters is at Manera Valleys, and that's at the tip of the Bataan Peninsula. Now, what were the commanders in charge of? And they knew it. What were the commanders really in charge of? Take a look at this. This comes right from the book that was co-authored with John McLaughlin. We are the battling bastards of Bataan. No mama, no papa, no Uncle Sam. All right, with this being the case, Japanese high command being successful up to this particular point with MacArthur being ordered off the islands. They make a certain number of judgments. I'd like to point out what those judgments are and what the subsequent actions happen to be. Person pictured here is General Homa arriving on Luzon. Confident of the successes and believing that the Air Forces are ahead of schedule to take Manila but with the Japanese high command orders. It starts to withdraw Homa's best divisions of the Philippines to engage them elsewhere. And then what Homa is ordered to do is on January 9th order his remaining forces to attack the U.S. forces now totally concentrated on the attack. And he does. And the attack succeeds initially in forcing U.S. forces back to a secondary line of defense on Bataan, where the attack is unexpectedly, unexpectedly halted by determined resistance, principally the U.S. military. Palmer, now with more than 2,700 dead, 4,000 wounded, 13,000 sick, he halts the operation on February 9th. Look what the Japanese High Command then do. They become very concerned that the battle for Bataan is giving the world that the, the impression that their forces, meaning the Japanese forces, can be defeated. And with this being the case, it's the first time such an impression has arisen since Japan has gone to war in Asia. 1931. This is the first time the Japanese military ever faced determined, truly determined opposition. So what does the high command do? They're dissatisfied with Homa. They shake up his entire command and they order him to resume the offensive, which he does on April 3rd. So what's the situation on Bataan now in April 1942? Well, one, take a look at the picture. And in essence, what you're looking at is by the first week of April, besieged U.S. forces on Bataan are all on one quarter rations. One quarter rations. And then after battling the Japanese forces on the peninsula for 99 days, the American military and Filipino forces are nearly out of food, liquids, but most importantly, ammunition. Ammunition, they put up a determined resistance to stop, to stop Japanese advance down the Bataan Peninsula. And now it's getting to a point where, without ammunition, all they could do was stand in the face of the Japanese and engage them hand to hand. 
90% of the men are ill from dysentery, malaria, beriberi, plus are suffering from very serious wounds. Another picture indicative of what was being experienced on the Tan Peninsula. And then the unavailability of medical supplies, it does result in the ultimate death of many of the ill and wounded. Morale at this point now very low, all now realizing that expected aid and reinforcements from the U.S. not on the way. <coughs> not on the way. <coughs> Who's the one that looked at this situation now and had to determine what to do next? That was the commander of the forces on the time, and that was General King. What he decides to do for the sake of his men be they American or Filipino, is to surrender those forces. And he does on April 9, 1942. Keep in mind, just over 75 years ago this year. Now, despite repeated orders from General Wayne Wright, as well as MacArthur, based in Australia, to continue to fight on now, with the Japanese less than a mile from a very critical medical facility underneath King's Command, what he decides to do is prevent any unnecessary slaughter, and he surrenders Bataan to the Japanese. It's the largest surrender of American forces ever. King knows that this is the case, and what he knows is also in violation of his orders from his superior officers. What does he fear? He ultimately fears he's going to be court-martialed. He's going to be court-martialed because he disobeyed orders. In reality, take a look at what that sentence up there notes. Everyone at this time understood the extreme circumstances that King was facing, his troops were facing, and as a consequence, charges are never filed against General King. Result, the Bataan Death March. The Bataan Death March. Picture of it, and let me indeed give you some description. A lot of this is coming right from the book. Forces on Bataan Peninsula the surrendered on April 9th. 67,500 Filipino, 10,500 U.S. soldiers were captured. And the captives, they made the march 65 miles to a POW camp known as Camp O'Donnell. And one of the reasons why they were forced to march is because of what's noted next. The Japanese lacked motor transport. They did not have motorized transport to carry the sick, to carry the wounded, to carry the malnourished. However, Regardless of this, those men, regardless of the status, were forced to now march to O'Donnell. As far as the captives, brutally treated on the march with many being beaten, clubbed, and bayoneted. The Bataan Death March, April 9th to the 21st, 12 days of brutality. 12 days. Uh, this gives you the path of the death march. Starts at Mirror Valleys, southern part of the Bataan Peninsula, and then in turn they move some 68 miles on foot up to San Fernando. San Fernando, they're placed on crowded boxcars and trained up to Capas, and then Capas, then they're offloaded and forced to march an additional five miles to Camp O'Donnell. Keep in mind the status that many of these men were in. Extremely poor health. Extremely poor health. And in essence, it was truly pure health. And this is what comes forth. This is what comes forth in Whitting Hill's memoir within the book. The been written. Very, very well described by an individual who survived the death march and then thereafter 
three and a half years of imprisonment. In many cases outside of Japan, but ending up in Japan when the war ends. And as noted, in Harry Wittenhill's memoir regarding the Bataan Death March, number of captives on the march, 67,500 Filipinos, 10,500 Americans. Number who died in the hot, dusty road to San Fernando, 8,500 Filipinos, 1,500 Americans. Number subject to brutality, being beaten and bayoneted or killed while on the march. Well, let me point this out to you because it is well described within Whitting Hill's memoirs. How were those on the road treated by Japanese soldiers who fell or stumbled? or just could not take another step forward, what did the Japanese soldiers do? They simply, like that, to every one of them. Every one of them. Principal reason being, how the Japanese see these men lying on the ground as being dishonorable and not deserving to live. Being dishonorable and not deserving to live. So the reason, that number is so high is because of the way the Japanese military did treat, did treat those prisoners. So as far as the number subject to brutality, being beaten and bayoneted, killed on the march, all. As far as the overall goal of the Japanese, it was to take not just the Bataan Peninsula, but all of the Philippines. And what comes about next is the surrender of the Philippines. Headquartered on Corregidor Island, that fortress in Manila Bay, two miles south of Bataan, is General Wainwright and his troops. And they're continually faced with an aerial attack without any hope of relief. And here is a picture of Corregidor Island. Now the island is heavily laced with an intricate tunnel system designed to protect troops serving on that island. But so intense is the Javis bombardment that it actually alters the island's terrain. Actually alters the island's terrain. As far as General Home is concerned, his forces ultimately land on the island on May 5th. And after some 11,000 defenders be begin suffering extreme, extreme heavy casualties, General Wainwright decides to surrender. Homa, he accepts the surrender at a formal ceremony on May 7th. Now this would have been the surrender ceremony, but we found out that we don't have the capability of, of showing it. I would like to point this out to you. When Wainwright does surrender, he surrenders not because he has been defeated in battle, because he hasn't. He surrenders because of lack of supplies and mass sickness in the ranks. He's forced to surrender all forces within the Philippines, not just those on Bataan, not just those in Luzon, but all the forces within the Philippine Islands. Wainwright initially resisted that, because he didn't have total command of all those forces south of Luzon. However, Homer simply put it this way, if you don't surrender all the forces, then those men that do surrender to my military will be killed. Will be killed. Therefore, you surrender everyone. You issue such an order to everyone. Otherwise, your men who do surrender will be murdered. What does Wainwright do? He orders everyone within the Philippines to give up to the Japanese. And now you understand why. 
one thing that came to the fore because of the determined, the determined resistance underneath Wainwright against the Japanese. He was, he was recommended for a Medal of Honor. However, look who turns down that recommendation. Look who turns it down. And by the way, guess who was awarded the Medal of Honor? General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur gets the Medal of Honor because of his stance within the Philippines. Now ultimately, does Wainwright receive the Medal of Honor after World War II? Yes. President Harry Truman pins the Medal of Honor on him because of, because of the fight within the Philippines. Batan, here's the initial evaluation, and you can read this also in the book. The last ditch defense of Batan is initially seen as futile and a costly effort. And the sacrifices of the fallen and captured viewed as being made entirely in vain. Entirely in vain. And despite the desperate 99 day battle, it's seen as having no influence on the Japanese military strategy and on the war in the Pacific. The result, the largest surrender of an American military force in any war that results in the brutal Bataan Death March. What this was, the scene of the actual Death March, again, we can't play it, so I'm going to move beyond it. The defeat on Bataan, however, let's take a look at it as it is seen today, as is seen today by military historians. One, the Battle of Bataan is now seen by historians as being an important <coughs> moral and psychological victory because dissatisfied with the command of the Philippine invasion force look what happens to General Homer he's recalled by the Japanese high command to Japan in August of 1942 and he remains in disgrace without command for the rest of the war for the rest of the war could have used Manila Harbor, it is denied to the Japanese for operational purposes until the end of May 1942. As far as the battling bastards of Bataan, they did give an enormous lift to American morale at home and the will to win just when it was needed after Pearl Harbor. Just when it was needed. As far as their stubborn defense, it became a significant propaganda victory for the U.S. for a proof that the Japanese army could be de defeated, that it was not invincible. So let's give them all a thumbs up. So in closing, we'd like you to understand this. News of the Death March, however, is withheld is withheld from the public by President FDR and his military chiefs because they fear that if the public got known of it and the Japanese heard that this was publicized, that the Japanese would conduct further retaliation against prisoners of war within their, their control if this news was released. So the news is not released until January 27, 1944. This is when you become aware. You become aware of the Bataan Death March. And the release was timed, in fact, to launch a major war bond drive and reinforce the fighting spirit of a war-weary U.S. At this time, keep in mind, we're now four years into a war. Four years into a war, you, the American public, are getting tired of the effort. We're getting tired of the effort. So what does the nation's news media do to help overcome this? They spin the event into wartime propaganda. And on January 30th, 1944, 
What does this do? It aids the Americans to understand a new, new military campaign that was just unleashed within the Central Pacific. And that's the drive that ultimately results in the surrender of Japan in 1945. So just when your support was necessary to further, further get behind the U.S. military in the Pacific, this information comes to the fore. Does it work? Yes. Take a look at this major poster that goes up across the United States. And what, what does it read? Oh, who, who can read that for me? What does that top sentence say? What are you going to do about what it? What are you going to do about it? Right. Mm -hmm. And then what is noted on the bottom by the press? Let's read that sentence. The job until every murdering Jap is wiped out. Right. Does this reinforce American morale and does it create support for the Central Pacific Drive initiated at the beginning of 43 and then through 1944? The answer is yes. So the sacrifices of the veterans and the fall of the Bataan were therefore not made in vain or forgot. The battling bastards improved American morale and spurred fighting spirit. Thank you. Well, um, we'll entertain questions and Nancy Webster and I are just going to set up a presentation so uh, Paul, if you'll entertain any questions. All right, yes, sir. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, what would have been a better way for the planes to be placed? Because you had to like the wings were together. Like, what would have been right. a, better, a better way to place them? To place At that particular time, they didn't have a plan. And the reason being, because in addition to a, a feared attack, they feared sabotage. They feared sabotage, and the best way to protect planes on an airfield was to group them. This is exactly what we did in the airfields around Pearl Harbor. Exactly what we did. It's one of the reasons why the Japanese attack on the airfields around Pearl Harbor was so successful, because the planes were grouped. The planes were grouped. Yes, sir. Yes. Are you okay? I thought I cleared up an issue. The I shall return. Please. The Carthus, the Carthus chief of staff, he asked the chief of staff to write a brief talk that he could give to the press once he arrived in Australia. The fellow wrote it. And what it said was, we shall return. The officer then showed it to a Filipino officer who had accompanied the Carthus people. The Filipino, who later went on to become Philippine ambassador to the United Nations. He said, forget about the we, because the people distrust Roosevelt, they distrust the American government, the only people, the only one they have any trust in is in you, is in MacArthur. Tell MacArthur to say I. He resisted it, but he ultimately did it. So that's where the I shall return. Nothing okay. to do with his ego. This is the, the Filipino officer talked to me the same. I, I shall return. It's just a because he knew the Filipino people trusted him personally. Okay. That's not the other thing. That's good. Thank you for that clarification. That's good. One of the books. We've got the bad judgment on not following Plan Orange. Right. But had he done that, the outcome would have been no different. The American Army, the Philippine Army, would have been well supplied, but isolated. It would have been three years before any American forces could have come. By then, they would have been wiped out anyway. So it would not have altered the fall of the Philippines. It, it may have dragged out the... The, right. The surrender of Bataan. Right. But it wouldn't have altered anything. No, it would not have altered. That's right. Manila Harbor would have been denied the use, well, it used by the Japanese for a longer period of time. Until the Japanese Air Force just dis dis destroyed any ability of shore batteries on Bataan to cover the bay. It, they would have done that in a couple of months easily, easily because they, had, okay. they dominated the air. Okay. Well, Thank you for the clarification. A question in the corner yeah. here. Yes. Two more, and then we'll start the presentation. Well, Chris Feller. First of all, superb lecture. 
Oh, thank you. Not only for the information, uh, but from um, the presentation. Um, it's very personal for me. And the reason is I knew these people, uh, at least the physicians. I served under them. Wow. Um, if you'll give me just a few Yes, if I play, let me give him the microphone. I think we'd all like to hear this. Um, I'll, I'll try and take it in order. My first experience was uh, in medical school. I applied for internships, and I applied for a military internship. Um, I'm very fortunate. I've been fortunate in many, many ways. But I got a letter of recommendation from uh, uh, Dr. Rathen, who was a, a uh, commander of the 20th uh, General Hospital uh, in the CBI. Um, and a letter of recommendation from him was tantamount to approval. Um, with that, um, he arranged for me to go down to the Surgeon General's office in Washington, and I met with a Colonel Glatley. Um, and uh, I told him that mm -hmm. I wanted to um, intern at Tripler in Hawaii, because I've, I've always been interested in Hawaii. Uh, and he listened to me, and he said, no, you don't. He said, you want to intern at Letterman in San Francisco, uh, where I did. He said, and then you can go to Hawaii. And the reason was that uh, uh, Letterman was in San Francisco. It's not there anymore. Uh, but the medical schools uh, contributed consultants to the hospital, and he thought I needed that type of education. And it and, uh, uh, changed uh, all my plans, but as many times in life, uh, you get a piece of information, and if you're smart enough to follow it, uh, you have a different life. Um, so I reported to uh, uh, Letterman at uh, graduation. The day I graduated, uh, I was already a first lieutenant in the reserves as an armored officer. The day I graduated, changed my insignia to medical corps and headed for San Francisco. The commander of the hospital was Jim Gillespie, uh, two-star general. Uh, I didn't know it at the time uh, in both instances. But Colonel Glatley uh, was a survivor of uh, not the Bataan Bath March, but of the hospital that they captured. Uh, and they were all uh, uh, captured as a unit. General Gillespie was the commander of the unit. Colonel Glatley was one of the uh, physicians, uh, prisoners. The second one was uh, Chief of Medicine, uh, Colonel Berry. Uh, it was a very interesting internship, to say the least, uh, because these people didn't talk very much at all about their experience. But there's a book called Barbed Wire Surgeon. I don't think it's still in print uh, that uh, describes the horrors uh, that they went through and how they survived. Uh, you all know about the uh, book uh, of, uh, Bridge on the River Kwai. That was fiction. This wasn't fiction. <laughs> they, they survived. We have to get on with the program. Okay. They survived because of their military training. Uh, my second uh, experience was uh, at uh, Tripler where I was a medical officer of the day, um, and uh, uh, they announced over the radio that uh, a, a, a captain on a tanker uh, had a medical problem. He's going to be here and back uh, to Tripler. And I knew what that meant. And then I helped to go down. and, uh, and uh, 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 transfer him from the plane to the hospital, and, and I did. 
Um, when I got aboard the plane, uh, he was on IVs and kind of reading around. And I made a quick, uh, one of the better <coughs> decisions in my life, that he was in congestive failure from overload of fluid. Uh, we got him back up to uh, uh, Tripler and we bailed him out. Uh, that night I turned off the IVs and uh, uh, his name was Bulkley. Bulkley's the PT commander that took MacArthur off of Corregidor. Uh He's a New Jersey boy, by the way. Um, he was on the officer's ward, which was not my assignment, but I visited him every day. And we had some marvelous conversation. Um, according to uh, uh, Wikipedia, uh, he had even a prior career uh, Bulkley. Uh, he was in San Francisco at the time, and the uh, Japanese uh, envoys um, had come into port. Um, he stripped off his shirt, swam over to their ship and stole their briefcase. An unbelievable person. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Let's show, let's show you guys, Ryan, Hi, this is more of a, a personal letter to John because um, a lot of people come into your life. This is really emotional. A lot of people come into your life and few make the impact that some people do, like John did. And I never expected it. What John did for me, let me walk over here. That's better. What John did for me is that he taught me why to love history. And history was not my favorite subject at school. I didn't care for it at all. But he showed me why history was so important. He showed me that it's not about the military, it's not about the facts or the dates, it's about the people and how it's affected them and how it affected the consequences and what made them great and what made them evil. But it's to acknowledge the evil, not to ignore it. And so with John, it was like when I met him, we all know John. He's like a bundle. He's like the Energizer Bunny that just takes like every day like a wet cloth and wrings it through. I mean, that is an amazing person. And his family, I, I got to know Mary Jean. And when I asked John, when I come up with ideas and I want to know something, he goes, so follow it through. It was just like a coach. If I want to have a coach, he was my, he was my history coach. Follow it through. Well, at one session here, um, I came, this is Ron. Uh, I came and I just asked him if I could videotape and he said sure and then I thought this is amazing like the way he did it the passion when he introduced it at the very beginning he'd always ask who's new and he cared like why where did you come from I remember one guy said um well I'm not from around here I'm from it was like a town start with an M and he goes oh the public library um your librarian's name is Alice Yes, it is. And that, that was John. He knew it and he cared and he, no t stone was unturned. So this was one of the first videos that really, like sometimes it's not, you don't know what it is, a line or some, something that somebody says that kind of clicks with you. This is Ron. And when I interviewed him afterwards to say, what makes this so special? This is what he said and this stuck to me. the adventures that she went on but at the end of it when she when she finally was reunited with her mother she wrote all of them down in a diary and her aunt gave her this cloth diary and the nurse really got mad and she's like you know what um, I went down to the Holocaust Museum down in Washington they interviewed me they heard about the diary they wanted the diary and what was I supposed to say so they gave so she gave the diary but one of her friends that she was with her the whole time she had just passed away and Ursula wanted to see her diary one more time so it took, John goes, we'll do something about it. And I thought, oh my gosh. So it took eight months and we're able to locate it. It was at a conservatory, but we got it taken, um, transported over to the uh, United States Holocaust Museum. And after we were given permission to take my camera there, and John and I and Mary Jean and Ursula went through every single floor and every single exhibit, and we videotaped her because to me, she told the narrative 
first person, and what an, imp what an honor it was to be with her. So we surprised her at the very end, and we, and we took her downstairs and we showed her her diary. And she also had other papers that she went through, and she was kind of talking about the other papers, and it's amazing because her two sons later on told me that they didn't know that those documents were even there. So you never know like what can happen. But so, typical John, after we had, Ursula had gone through all of it, then John takes a mic and he wants to know more about the people that are working there. So this is something that he did, and he said, we gotta show this to the group, because his whole thing was that Ursula was afraid, what if they took my, my items that I gave and they threw them in the drawer somewhere? And he goes, we have to go back and tell people that when you donate your items to the Holocaust Museum, this is what happens. So John wanted you guys to watch this.